next from CBS Sports, the NCAA Basketball Championship. It's Gary Parrish. Welcome back. CBS Sports Eye on College Basketball Podcast, where we sometimes discuss camel fighting, dodo birds, leaky black. The Eye on College Basketball Podcast is presented by Jersey Mike's. Jersey Mike's, a sub above. Matt Norlander is here with me. If you're watching on YouTube, smash the like button. Like your Brandon Davies. You have consent. And uh, don't forget why you're here. If you haven't already done it, please subscribe to the CBS Sports College Basketball YouTube channel. Okay, let's get into it. Congratulations to the UConn Huskies. They defeated Seton Hall on Sunday on CBS, America's most watched network, network of stars. Final score, UConn 91, Seton Hall 61, 30-point victory. That means Huskies have secured the outright Big East title for the first time since 1999. There's a lot of different ways to illustrate just how impressive this is for, for Dan Hurley and his program. Perhaps this is the most impressive way to put it. Mm. UConn won the 2023 NCAA tournament, lost three of the top six scores, returned to a league with two other top 15 teams, and the Huskies now have a three-game lead in the Big East standings, and they just won the Big East outright with a full week left in the regular season. Wow. Ten leg. Yes. That's yeah. pretty good. That's pretty yeah. good stuff. I thought, now, listen, GP's been uh, getting his dad duty on, so... Just for this episode, I thought you might say, I thought you might trivia time with me. So you I thought you were gonna ask Norlander for the first time since, and I had it ready. I had it ready on the board. Like that that was all over the telecast, I it guess. Was. Okay, so I just heard it. I, I'll be completely honest. I had no idea that was true until I heard it. And when I heard it, I was like, that can't be true. <laughs> I it, knew it was. I knew it was true, but when I heard it, I'm like. That sounds it's it's the type of thing that is clearly true. It just sounds like it shouldn't be. Not only is it true, if you thought like I thought, you're like, oh, OK, well, because it's the first time they've had a share of they have the outright, but it's the first time they've had a regular season championship of any kind since 06. You're like, OK, but it's like first time since 06 because they were in the American and they won a regular season title. No, no, this this is what is factual and or it was factual until all of six hours ago. The University of Connecticut's men's basketball program had won five national championships since the last time it won an outright regular season <laughs> conference tournament title. That's an absurd, abs utterly absurd statistic when you consider the program and what it's done since then. But yes, they have it outright here and they made no doubt about it at all. Seton Hall guy hit the first bucket of the game and went up three nothing. I think it held like a five to three lead, but uh but yeah, man, they just they they pulled away. We're obviously not going to break down UConn Seton Hall. There's not much to break down. UConn avenged uh, a loss on the road. Obviously, Dan Hurley uh, just just hammers down on his alma mater in a very impressive way. And so, in doing so, uh, we'll get to the results later in the show. But if you can, if you're watching on YouTube, we appreciate you. The chat question poll question is right now: to win the title, would you take UConn, Houston, and Purdue, or the field, one or the other? We'll get to the results later. But UConn winning allowed that question to uh to be there because houston uconn and purdue obviously all won this weekend uh take it where you want to gp with uh with uconn big east or otherwise well with uconn i mean they just they blow out people i think this is actually true they they blow out people more than anybody else um they they are i know you you're real particular about what you call a lock and what you don't i am yeah I, I, and I, I respect that are you UConn, comfortable what? uconn's a lock <laughs> Lock in. Are you? Are they a lock to be a one seed at this point? Yeah, I, you know what? I so I was thinking about this last night in the studio with Hakeem Dermis on CBS Sports HQ. I think they are. When you look at, every, I think that Purdue, UConn, and Houston. I think we'll, we'll keep the Houston Purdue stuff till later. But I think they're all. I think I'm there, man. I think they're I'm, so far oh, ahead of everybody else. It's not like, like I, 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 I get to I think, again. If they they literally for lock purposes. No matter how unlikely, can you literally lose every remaining game and not, you know, lose your seed line or get into the tournament? I don't see a scenario in which any of those schools lose three games in a row and they're still getting passed up by the likes of Arizona, Tennessee, UNC. And that's really it's going to be one of those three teams, I think, at this point, I think at this point that winds up with the with the one seed. Maybe there's a stunner late, but I don't I'm, you know, Baylor, maybe if they ran the table, I guess. I don't know. But no, I think that I think that they are. GP, I do. I think they're all locks. I mean, they're pretty – if they're not, they're close. And, like, I have Tennessee fans because I've had Tennessee 
in the top four. So as the fourth number one seed, uh, really since the morning after Arizona lost to Washington State, I dropped Arizona out, moved Tennessee in. And then since then, Tennessee's added like big wins, right? They uh, they beat Auburn. They, they, they beat Alabama. We'll get to that later. Um, and I got Tennessee fans asking like, hey, hey, where, where, where can we go? And I'm like, there's nowhere for you to go. Like the, the, you're sort of fucking four. There's, yeah, it's, there's, no, there's nowhere to I, go. Yes. It's if Tennessee won out and say, uh, is you Houston have the worst of the three right now? I don't, I, it, it's so the, the it's margins so are like, so I thin. Think, I mean, I I, think I, they, they, like, it I is, think they can jump anyone. I mean, maybe if they won out, won the sec title, although on that note, the sec fans are all too familiar with this, that sec championship it doesn't means, matter. It never matters. It never means a damn thing. So like even more reinforced, like if there's, some of them definitely mean less than others. There is no league at the power conference level, no league period that has less meaning on its championship game ever than the SEC. And that includes the Big Ten, which ends like 17 minutes before we get the damn bracket. The SEC still matters less than that when it comes to a championship game. So, so yeah. for, for Tennessee to crack the top three at this point, or anybody, I think it requires at the very least anybody, Tennessee, Arizona, whoever you like, for them to crack the top three at this point, I think it requires Houston, Purdue, UConn, one of those teams, losing at least two more times. They have to lose out. They might have to lose out. I do. I, think I mean, yeah, they, they're that's so not, that's not gonna happen, so. they're so separated from the pack. So I, I back to UConn, the, the killing people. We could. I'm, I'm a little bored with the debate, and I'm, I'm trust that listeners are too of the de- debate between UConn and Purdue and and Houston. Just I'm telling you, it's very close, very close. And if you want to make a case for any of those three teams, you can make a case for them. Purdue, I think, is just broadly speaking, best body of work. UConn looks the most dominant, and Houston is number one in most of the computers. You can make the case for any of them. So UConn, well, let's, for the sake of this conversation, let's call them a lock to be a, a one seed. After that, it was a missed opportunity for Seton Hall. That's all it is, I think, a missed opportunity. You cannot be expected as a bubble team to I go know. to UConn and win. They roll. That's but it. they got rolled. They got absolutely dominated. They didn't lose by six. It was a non-competitive the entire second half. Um, I should say I'm a little hesitant to even talk about the NCAA tournament and brackets in the Big East with Adam Zagori out there in them Twitter streets just waiting to take what shots. <laughs> what oh, but I don't know. I honestly don't know what happened, okay. except Zags, Zags apparently now has it in for the – let me make sure I get it quoted right. The CBS Sports Bracketology guys. Who are the CBS – <laughs> I'm clear. I'm clear. What, like an eight, I don't oh, do a bracket. It's two people. Who? It's, who? You. it's you. I'm a bracketology guy. Jerry Parrish and Gary Palm. That's okay. who he was talking about. You think he's talking about me? <laughs> I do. I do. I, I hope he's not talking about I me. Think, I think, in fact, I think he was channeling Dan Hurley talking about the squirrels. I have that new to the board as well. You're going to get this real quick here. Squirrels, a squirrel. A squirrels, a squirrel person, a squirrels. But a squirrel, I think that's a squirrel. I think you might be a squirrel in the eyes well, of Well, now I, now I feel like I got to take it personally. <laughs> I thought I just wanted him to like, hey, tag Jerry Palm next time. He's our bracket guy. I don't know what, but do we on and, and dead honesty because we had someone text us about this. I don't know what this is in reference to. I, th- I maybe it's because there's so many Big East teams that have like been near the cut line, and Palm didn't have Seton Hall or Providence or St. John's in the field. I'm guessing that's what it is. The the the, the thing I saw was he was very offended, like like incredibly offended at some point recently that Seton Hall was not in Jerry Palm's bracket. He was very upset about that. Okay. okay. <laughs> I don't know why you would go to war for a team that's in the 60s in the net. <laughs> like, I, that seems like a bad spot to pick he's, your war. He's a, he's a Jersey guy, too. So I, I know. It. I get it. I get it. He's a Jersey guy. Seton Hall, you know, Shaheen. I, I, got, I love Shaheen as much as the next guy, right? But I ain't going to be out there trying to fight Jerry Palm over a team in the 60s. <laughs> By the way, yeah. So they were 62nd in the net, Seton Hall was. Okay. This morning. Before they lost by 30. All right. Yeah. So you got to think that's going the wrong way. They're, they're dropping. Yes. Okay. Um, only two teams in the 60s in the net on Selection Sunday last year got at large bids. Arizona State got an 11. Pitt got an 11. They both went to the first four. All right. Mm-hmm. Year before, 
So, so, so let's just focus on last year. Ten teams in the 60s on Selection Sunday. There were ten of them, right? That's just how math works. Eight of them did not get at large. Just two did. <laughs> in 2022, right. only one team in the 60s of the net on Selection Sunday got an at large. Mm-hmm. Miami got a 10 seed. So mm-hmm. there are ten teams in the 60s. Once again, math. That's how math works. Yeah. Uh, nine teams didn't get at large. Just one did. Top 40. Just if you're curious, top 40 in the net means you're usually safe. Not definitely, but I'm usually. Definitely. Not not definitely, but usually. You're usually safe. Outside of the top 40, you get dicey. In the 60s, you're probably not. And this is what Zags wants to fight Jerry Palm and apparently me over. And by the way, I've never said a goddamn word about Seton Hall. Not one. <laughs> Maybe mean, that's the problem. They haven't appeared in the top 25. And one. Have they? Has Seton Hall been in their top 25 and one at any point this season? Do you I, maybe, but I don't remember. Yeah, certainly, remember. certainly not lately. Let me tell you, since I'm a bracketology guy myself, let yeah. me tell you all the things I've said about the Big East and the bracket. Here's all the things I think I've said. Yep. UConn is a lock to be a one seed. All right. And I think if you don't mind, it was a week ago when people were saying St. John's at large hopes are dead. I was like, I don't think they are. Well, guess who's in the bracket today, according to Jerry Palm, St. John's. Yeah. So the only things I've ever said about the Big East in the bracket is UConn is awesome. And St. John's has at large hopes, whether you believe it or not. I think that's the extent of it. I don't know how I got roped into this thing, but take it up with Palm, Zags, or 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 more intelligently. Don't start fights about teams in the 60s and the Nets. That's dicey to begin with. By the way, two weeks out, obviously, from selection. Two weeks from now, uh, well, you'll be on CBS Sports Network and I'll be in HQ. We'll be breaking down the bracket. But a little more than two weeks to the hour, GP and I will have our selection Sunday. So I got to wrong myself here on the St. John's thing. Wrong, 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 wrong. Man, oh, man. I said they wrong, were not going wrong, to the tournaments. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Hey, hey you, they still might not. I'm just, the I only know. thing I ever said I'm was. I'm wrong right now. No, if I were you, I would just keep holding on to all I – I didn't say they didn't have a chance. I just said they're not going to be there and just hope they're not there. Oh, yeah. You know Sunday. what, though? It's better for our jobs if St. John's and Rick Pitino are in the tournament. Can it's you awesome. imagine with that much more opportunity in front of a, in front of the media what the hell Rick Pitino is going to say? Come on. <laughs> incredible. What have we else? ever seen – a team this laterally slow and physically weak get an at-large bid to the NCAA tournament. That's going to be the big question there. No, I, no I can't wait. I know. I can't wait till somebody asks Rick about his laterally slow, physically weak team in the NCAA tournament. So I, I never said they're going to make it or that they're not going to make it. I just said I'm looking at it, and I'm telling you there is a path to an at-large bid. There's, Here we are. Yeah, Here we are. I mean, I, I'll say this, though. They're 18 11, Seton Hall is. And now, in my opinion, ugh, I mean, can't lose at home to Nova. And then they got to Paul. So, in order to just be in the conversation heading into the biggest tournament, got to win the next two in order to stay on the good side of the bubble. Let's quickly tour around the biggies while we're, right. while we're doing this, GP. Um, I'll stick with the bubble stuff. Then we'll get to Creighton Marquette real quick. Uh, Nova goes into Providence 71 to 60, a win early in the day on Saturday. Um, Nova had an 18 to two run to open the second half and break the game wide open. Providence couldn't make a game out of it. Nova has won five of his past six games. Um, I was extremely impressed and some of it was a little bit of three point luck, but also give them credit for it. They were 13 of 23 from three point range on the road, man, a really balanced effort overall, really good on the defensive glass. Nova uh, hats off, man. That was a, that was a big win. You're four and eight in quad one. Your resume is fascinating as hell. You're at Seton hall. That's going to be a quick turnaround there later this week. And then home versus Creighton. So in the same way that like, Seton Hall missed an opportunity that not expected to win. I get all that. And now it's facing kind of two got to have it wins. I would still say Nova's in that same situation, except it's on the road to Seton Hall, home to Creighton. So it's, I mean, it's up and down. The The cut line with the Big East is, dude, it's fascinating itself because it, Butler was in this thing comfortably and now it's slip sliding away. Meantime, Providence not gone. I think Providence might be Palm's first team out as a Sunday yeah. morning. I got it. I got it if you need it. Um, uh, So... Right now, he's got UConn as a one seed, Marquette as a two, Creighton as a three. He's St. John's as an 11. It's that's the, the of Mexico and then everyone else, yes. That's the last team in, all right? St. John's, by the way, 39th in the net. Then, as of this morning, he had Seton Hall first team out. Okay. I know well, losing to problem. UConn shouldn't hurt you, but yeah, like but it will. losing by a billion, it will. Yeah. Um, he has Villanova as the third team out after Villanova beat Providence by 11. Villanova, by the way, would be a one seed if they just dropped out of the Big Five. Well, basketball tradition in Philly, man. It means more. It's going to cost them an NCAA tournament bid, maybe. Providence is now not even first four out anymore, according to Palm. They're just out of the bracket after losing two straight. And yeah, Butler 
has dropped even further below that. I actually don't see an at-large path for Butler anymore. So uh, Only like a Big East. Like if they made the Big East semis, I actually think it would be back on the board there, but they'd have to win to the Big East semis. But yeah, maybe, maybe. Really- it's going to be tough. Um, so again, at the risk, at the risk of getting, at the risk of talking about things I don't know about <laughs> as a bracketology guy. Yeah. Um, you have three Big East teams that are locks, four that are in the tournament right now, according to Palm. But that fourth, St. John's, is still technically a bubble team. So is Seton Hall. So is Villanova. So is Providence. They could they could have, you ready for this, seven or three or anything in between. It, it's incredible. And you can't say, I mean, actually, I don't know the answer for this for sure. <laughs> is it, I, I'll send a text and fi- try and find this out in time for the next episode. Uh, I would imagine it's not in the writing for the selection committee. It's sending four teams to Dayton from the same conference. I actually think that that probably <laughs> is not against protocol because they want to break down these things and these teams to where you're going where you're going. <laughs> the idea, and it's not going to happen, but can you imagine if we had St. John's versus Providence <laughs> <laughs> and Seton Hall versus Villanova going to Dayton. <laughs> just be, it's just an extended an extension of the Big East tournament. That would be wild. I am putting the over under at 1.5 Big East teams going to Dayton, and I think I am taking the over. I think I'm. I think we're getting two games, two teams, and two games not playing each other in Dayton. And I'm not joking about that. They are just they're they've been populating the cut line for weeks now, and it doesn't seem to be the situation uh, seems static overall. And it is um it's fascinating. Providence, by the way. So Providence is seasoned, you know, teetering a bit here. It's next game at Ed Cooley and Georgetown. <laughs> Ed Cooley and Georgetown, you know, not been imagine Ed Cooley beating Providence and just completely puncturing the tournament hopes that's coming up in a couple of days. Then they got to finish at home against UConn. So we're going to have a lot more clarity about just like what these teams are going to need to do a week from now heading into the Big East tournament. It's certainly worth uh, noting there. Quickly, GP Creighton beats Marquette. It was a good game for most of the most of the afternoon. And then Baylor Shireman hit, I think it was like three threes in about a minute there. They didn't have Tyler Cole because of the oblique injury. He didn't even travel with the team. Also, Igadaro got sick. So if anything, Marquette's performance without two of its three most important players, I thought was was damn admirable and uh, for Creighton man they've defeated two AP top five opponents in one season for the first time ever in school history Um, and they are getting I think Baylor Shireman is the second team All-American at this point in this game in particular he went for 26 points 16 rebounds he's the first since a guy named Doug McDermott to go for at least 25 and 15 in the game then McDermott did it the year he won national player of the year he was awesome Trey Alexander had 18 points 11 assists um, he's had back-to-back double doubles. Impressive stuff from Creighton, uh, even with Marquette being shorthanded. I thought they they played well. They rallied late, and uh, Shireman, man, he's been just he's been an absolute dude as of late. So not as much drama around those teams like Marquette and Creighton feel like they're destined to either be a two or a three, and that can matter. Like, don't get me wrong, but that was just a good game, and I was impressed with Marquette showing up and playing. The score was not as close as the, as as the game, or yeah, the final score was. Not as not close, I guess, as the game right. was in the first 36 minutes. If you just look at the box score, you're like, okay, that makes sense. Marquette down Kolick. Also, by the way, down also Igadaro. Yeah. Like they were down two starters. I mean, it, like. <laughs> yes. The, uh, yes. Did you say that. that? Yes. I only heard Kolick. Oh, yeah. No, I did say. I said. Okay. okay. I heard you say Kolick. I didn't hear you say uh, oh. Igadaro. So they're down those two. So, but they, it was uh, just to put an actual number on it. One possession game with 411 left. All right. 69 yep. 67 Creighton, and then Creighton closed on a 20 to 8 run, one by 14. I moved Creighton up to number eight in the top 25 and one. Folks, that's you see. Yeah, I would have. So Palm has it, um, Marquette two, Creighton as a three. I would have it Creighton as a two, Marquette as a three, but we're splitting hairs here. And yeah, that can flip back. We got plenty. This is, this is not the place I'm going to start a war with Jerry Palm. Well, I don't. We'll see what Zagori says about that. But yeah, yeah, Zags, how do you feel? What? How do you feel about the Creighton Marquette situation? <laughs> before before you lambast everybody who works at CBS Sports, <laughs> this dude's just out there. Not everyone, everyone, just the bracketology guys. So it really was just the bracketology guys. He said the bracketology guys, and now I just found out he thinks I'm one of them. Yeah. Well, you are. You rank your teams based upon their bracketology resumes. You are. All right. Well, now I'm taking offense. <laughs> All right. Now I'm going to tweet something negative about the Almond Brothers. Hey, just, don't just, you dare. Don't just, you dare. You want to go after Zags? You go after <laughs> Ultimate Frisbee. You keep the music out of it. You understand me? I'm going to tweet. I'm going to tweet something right now about Frisbees. I'm going to tweet something right now negative about Frisbees. 
the Allman Brothers, and the Hudson River. <laughs> okay. You're just trying to put my no context on a T like, right now. I, I, I wish, buddy, if I was standing near the Hudson River, there's nothing I'd rather do than throw a bunch of Frisbees and Allman Brothers albums in there. Let them, <laughs> let them float you. away. Live Close at Fillmore them. East, one of the best live recordings ever. Quote Look that. Me. All right, Zags, you come for us. We, now we're coming for you. All right? That's 20 minutes on the biggies. We got a lot to get to. Shall we, should we break here? <laughs> Before you toss Segoria into the Hudson River, can we break? <laughs> yeah, let's get a word. For, let's, as, as long as we still got, I thought Zags was one of our partners. I guess not. I guess friendships die in the dark. Give us a. <laughs> All right, dead leg. Love it. Love it. Elsewhere in the sport, yeah. Tennessee won at Alabama, t- took control of the SEC race that you couldn't care less about. No, that's not true. <laughs> I need to rephrase. I, I <laughs> care about the SEC race. Let me be clear on that. I was just more, I was, you know, I was engaged in the game and the matchup, and it does mean something. How people okay. out, were like, you really don't care about conference? <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually do. I think this Friday was a weird show. We were all over the map there. So, Congratulations to Tennessee for getting a very, very important win on the road. GP, you can continue, continue setting it up. Uh, uh, well, I, I just liked it. I liked it because I'm usually the one that gets accused of not caring about anything other than court stormings. Yeah. So, and I care, uh, and I care about basically everything in the sport. So for me to come out. <laughs> <laughs> I just love that you were just out of nowhere. Like, I don't give a shit about conference titles. <laughs> so that was perfect. Anyway, Tennessee 81, Alabama 74. We were in Tuscaloosa. Vols are now 13-3 and in the SEC. So I got a one game lead over Alabama with two to play. Like I mentioned earlier, I've had them as the fourth number one seed, Tennessee, um, fourth in the top 25 and one since mm-hmm. February 23rd, um, since Arizona lost to Washington State on that Thursday night. Jerry now has Tennessee as the fourth number one. Other bracketologists elsewhere have other teams. I've seen Arizona, but Jerry's moved Tennessee there. Are you on board with that? Would you, what, do you, what, do you what do you make of Tennessee as the fourth number one? Uh, I make of them to be the best candidate to be the fourth one right now. Of course, if this is the case and the Vols wind up being there, uh, they would get shipped out west, being the one in the west, and it becomes a discussion about do you want to be the one and have, you know, when you start the bracket, theoretically the better line, or would you rather be the two and maybe geography, and we'll see, whatever. One seed is something to be proud of and uh, a really, really cool accomplishment. Tennessee doesn't really uh, hardly ever get them. In fact, someone might have mentioned this in the chat. I don't know if Tennessee has ever had a one. On, uh, next to its name, I don't know off the top of my head. Maybe uh, maybe the chat can help us out in real time there. Good win, though, real quick on the game. 81-74. I, I told you that I didn't think this, the winner of this one was going to get to 90. And for Tennessee to hold Bama to 74 points in that building was impressive. Now, Bama made three buckets in the final... F- you know, sports wild, man. That's why I love it, though, because you can get these weird, weird... Uh, departures of behavior from any kind of team, good and bad, and it was bad for Bama. I mean, that team only making three field goals in the final 14 minutes on its home floor was stunning. Nine of 29 in the second half from the field for Alabama. Some of it was Tennessee's defense, obviously, but some of it was, frankly, some bad shot luck there. And uh, the other major thing from the game is that Dalton Connect had 13 points on 14 shots. They didn't need him to be a stud, you know, uh, Triple J, Josiah Jordan, James, 11 points, 13 rebounds. Zakai Ziegler, 18 points and 18 shots. Like, he had a couple of big shots, but he wasn't ultra-efficient. Jonas Adu played really well, I thought, team-wise. It was a really good all-around effort, and it was the kind of win where, see, Tennessee under Rick Barnes has been a tournament underachiever. It's just a fact. They haven't lived up to seed expectation, but I do put real credence into this win, getting them to the one line where GP had them before there, and I, I give it more credence to Tennessee being a real final four contender. I don't know if I will have the stones to do it once we have a bracket in our hands two weeks from this moment, GP, but you do this, hold Bama to 74, um, and you don't need Connect going off for 36. These are very positive signs if you're a Tennessee fan. It's not a perfect team. Obviously, it is a beatable team, but yeah, Vols have been looking pretty damn good lately, and that's a really nice win. You go on the road against a a team that's in the top 10 and basically every computer been uh, a darling of the predictive metrics all season. Um, and you hold, and, and they're, you know, an incredible offensive team. You hold them to 38.3% shooting from the field. Alabama was nine of 37 from three. That's 24.3%. Like you said, Dalton connect didn't have to, you know, it was a, it was, I was going to say that it was a below average game for him. Right. 
it was below average. It was like a C plus, B minus. Chat's telling us, by the way, Tennessee's never had one. That's what I thought, but I didn't want to declare without having that. Uh, yeah. Don't connect. Five of 18 from the field, 13 points, five rebounds, one of seven from three. Um, not that we ever were seriously in a national player of the year debate. Some people were trying to cook one up. Like that, that what happened this weekend should have. It should have never started, but it should certainly put it into that. Don Connect should be a first-team All-American based off current numbers. Nobody is touching Zach Eady based off of current numbers. Um, but to me, that's the encouraging thing for Tennessee. You go, we didn't score like crazy. We didn't get a great performance from our star, and we still went to Coleman Coliseum and, and beat them. You know, that's a, that's a great sign. Here's what's interesting going forward is that I admit clearly they have control of the race there. You have a one game lead with two to play. Mm -hmm. next, isn't it tough? I don't have it in front of me, but I think it's at South Carolina and then, again, and then Kentucky at home. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you could lose both of those. You could win both of them, but you could lose both of them. You could, you could, uh, yeah. I mean, frankly with Tennessee, I can see two, two Oh one, one Oh two. Uh, all those, yeah, are all of it, all of it's on the table. Yep. Very, very much. So, and, and quick on Bama, I, I thought this a week ago, just with the defensive lack of performance against Kentucky. I'm just not going to – fun team can run it up. The, too many losses, I, I just don't trust it. Whether they wind up with a three or four next to their name, I'm just uh, – to me, I would not take Bama to make the Final Four. I just – I cannot trust that team and that defense to show up four games in a row. It might win a race in the first two and get to the Sweet Six. It might It might be a situation where t uh, Alabama gets – let's say it gets a three – so it plays a 14, it beats the 14, 105, 77, and then it plays a six and it beats them 92 to you know 80. And it's like, well, geez, I mean, look at this team. And then they get to the sweet 16 and then you're facing maybe a two seed. And it's not that easy. I, I, you know, they, they've got a really, really good chance to win a couple of games. I, I will not trust this team to win four times and make the final four because the defense I've seen, I've seen too much and they've lost to too many good teams too many times. I I passionately disagree with the people who say you can't win a national championship playing this way, shooting threes this way, because Villanova's already done it, all right? Villanova did it in 2018. Nearly half of their shots came from three. People, Some people forget that, but like, I still see folks on TV and other places saying you just can't win the championship shooting this many threes. Villanova's already done it, all right? What you can't do, I think, is survive a single elimination tournament with a defense like this shooting that many threes. Mm -hmm. I think that's the problem. Villanova's defense was ranked top 15 in the country in 2018. So when they were making shots, they bombed you. They blew you out. And when they weren't making shots, they could hang in there because of the defense. When Alabama's not making shots, they can't really hang in there. And so you got to, even if you're a top four seed, Okay, you should be able to play below average and still win your first game. Teams do lose them, but you should be able to play below average and win your first one if you're a top four seed. After that, everything gets hard. You, and, and are you going to trust them to shoot well enough from because you know they're taking them? They're taking them no matter what. So are you going to trust them to make shots three straight games after the round of sixty four? Because if they don't, they can't guard well enough to win. That's that's just hard. That's tough. It is hard. Bama still rates as a top 10 team. It's 20 and nine. Every other team in the top looking right now, top 19 at Ken Palm has fewer than nine losses. And most of them are sitting there at, at six or seven. And then you got your top three Houston, UConn, Purdue with, uh, with three apiece. That's all I got here. You want to take one more break with our partners before we do a little whip around? Yeah, let's whip around the rest of the country. We're going to do that next. But first, let's get a, let's pay some more bills. Another word from the partners. Let's go. Who's in? Who's out? Let the madness begin. The NCAA Men's Basketball Championship Selection Show on CBS and streaming on Paramount+. Plus. All right. What else we need to know from the weekend? All right. Let's go Big 12 here. Let's do a whip around and start here. Houston 87, Oklahoma 85. You've got to be shedding me with the way that game ended there. Jamal Shedd. Um, Big time bucket there. It was Houston's closest margin of victory this season. And also, uh, Houston allowing 85 points was uh, was a stunner there. They had five players in double figures. LJ Cryer had 23. The game had 16 lead changes and 11 ties. Really good performance out of Oklahoma. It's 19 and 10, though. Lost four of its last five. I don't think it's on firm NCAA tournament ground. I think they're going to make it, but they are not. Obviously a lock. Baylor beat Kansas 82-74. Uh, this was a seed flip for Palm. Baylor jumped to a two, KU down to a three. McCuller did return. A week ago, Bill Self said he didn't know. He was hoping to get McCuller back before the end of the season. That lasted a week. He played, and he was in the starting lineup and uh, really was a 
you know, an impactful player there. But uh, Baylor, man, oh man, they just uh, they they had the goods offensively, and and Kansas could not keep up there. Um, Baylor, let's see, Kansas shot. Kansas shot 65.2% in the first half. Baylor still held the lead at halftime. And then Ray J. Dennis played well in the second half. He finished with 19 points, 10 assists. And uh, Baylor's now won four straight against Kansas, by the way. And this is the first time in Bill Self's career he's ever lost seven conference tournament games. He did coach a bad Oral Roberts team when it wasn't independent. That is somewhat of a technicality. And then the other one just worth mentioning is Iowa State went on the road and didn't get tripped up. 60-52 to at UCF. Cyclones have won seven of eight. UCF hit one three-pointer, one of 19, and had 22 turnovers. So that is uh, that is your quickie Big 12 whip around. What's your biggest takeaway? Well, we've now reached the point with Kansas where they've gotten seven league losses. Yep. I, I saw this a lot over the weekend. Do you realize this is the first time Bill Self's ever lost seven Big 12 games? It's the first time he's ever lost seven conference games. That's right. He started coaching in the 1993-94 season. For some of those years, he was an independent, so didn't have conference games. Um, but this is the first time he's ever lost more than six. He's also at risk of finishing outside of the top three in the final league standings for the first time ever. Not in the Big Ten, not in the Big 12, not in any league he's ever been in. He's never finished outside of the top three. They're on pace to do that right now. So... Kansas's resume is still strong, but that team has been flawed. We've known it for a while, and they don't need everybody to play well to win. Uh, like, and by everybody, I just mean they're five starters, but they've got to get good performances. They, they cannot rely on anything off the bench. They're not going to get some surprise performance off the bench almost ever. So the starters have got to be good. McCullough came back and played. Was not that great. Uh, Johnny Furphy, I don't have the box score in front of me. I feel like he didn't shoot it well. Um, and like, oh, by the way, it's just like, you know, it's a it's a loss at Baylor. You know, like team, teams are going to, like, that's not, that's not bad. But it, uh, you know, it, it, this is an unusual season for Kansas. I'm not counting anything out in the NCAA tournament. But they are doing things under Bill Self that they've quite literally never done before and not in a good way. Um I like seeing Kelvin win at Oklahoma. I, I'm not rooting against Oklahoma. I couldn't care less. I just I like people to have good memories. And um, I, I saw an interview with Kelvin. I don't remember where it was but within the past few days. It might have been from this weekend. But he was talking about you know one of the things he's realized as he gets older is that uh, you cry a little more often than you used to. And I think that just means you're a little more in tune with your emotions. And you know you I don't know like, like I I I. I I've known that to be true in my own life. You 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 connect with things a little differently than maybe you did when you were younger as you start to as you start to get older. So I know that was Kelvin's own little way. Like he'd never come out and I think directly say everything he felt. It's just not his nature, but I know that meant something to him and for them to go in and and then for Jamal Shed to have that moment at the you know in literally in the final second. Uh terrific. And then Iowa State, you know, Kansas lost at UCF. Other teams have lost at UCF. Iowa State just goes there and wins. I know that their non-conference strength of schedule was 328, according to the net, and that bothers some people. I, I couldn't care less about it. Like, that only matters to me if you then go into your league and you fall on your face. Yeah, they I, have, I, I mean. They, they, have they, they are, they're, they're in second, they're alone in second in the best league in the country. Yeah. Iowa State should not be the poster person or thing. Team. Uh, team good word um of anything negative as it as it pertains to being computer trickers i know they were they they had um strong computer numbers before they ever had a resume and that bothered some people but they now have quite literally one of the great resumes in college basketball like they're they're one of the teams still in contention to be the fourth number one seed so i don't get why people like to focus too much on numbers with them like i'm just watching the basketball team and the basketball team maybe it's not the prettiest basketball team you've ever seen but i mean it, it's it's march 3rd they're legit they're real <laughs> they they absolutely are tj Otzelsberger is in that you know discussion for top 10-ish coach of the year he's done a great job um results from the poll as i transition to purdue and big 10 stuff here would you take well actually before i give it to you right now right now uconn purdue houston or the field 
to win the NCAA tournament? What would you take right now? I would like for somebody smarter than I to tell me what I, mathematically. We'll get more than 50% for sure. Okay. I'm I almost think... positive. The field versus UConn, Purdue, and Houston, I'm almost positive it would be more than 50%. Okay. You know what? I, 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 I know that to be genuine generally true yeah so i assumed it was probably true yeah. except in this case i might really just take those three they're so much better than everybody else i so i would so i i'm acknowledging i would i would take the three and it would not be the better play uh because it's three teams versus everyone else i can win it but um how can you not be impressed with those three right now poll results the chat 52 percent taking uconn purdue or houston to win it 48 percent taking the field that's what we like to see let's talk talk the big 10 here real quick purdue um wins 80 to 74 michigan state that had been a house of horrors for sparty for the past decade it really what they lost but it wasn't as bad as it's been in recent years um uh, zach Eady. <laughs> 32 points on 15 shots, 11 rebounds, second straight 30 point double double, his seventh of the season. And he has 60 double doubles for his career. Purdue has locked up a regular season championship and done so in consecutive years for the first time since they did three in a row, 94 to 96. Um, how about this one? And credit to Chris Foreman, the SID at Purdue for this. So the win here for Painter, it was his 17th win against Izzo. So he has won more against Tom Izzo than any other coach. And yet his career record is 17 and 16. So he's gotten over on Izzo and he is barely over 500. Uh, speaks to what Izzo's done and how great he's been in that league, obviously. Purdue has now won four in a row against Michigan State. And, you know, it's it's obviously right there for uh, for number one overall seed. It's in, it's in the driver's seat. Braden Smith and Fletcher Lawyer both look great. And uh, Michigan State, I'll send it back to you here in a second, GP. Michigan State's 8 and 12 in quad one, quad two. I find their tournament case to be damn fascinating right now. And I say their upper end 11 seed at the absolute most. They've tw got 12 losses. That's a lot. The other Big Ten thing, Illinois, 91, Wisconsin, 83. Although, shots to Nebraska, you didn't get tripped up. Rutgers didn't walk in. And uh, Nebraska, you're going to the tournament. And that's an awesome story there. So at least mention that. That finished while we started podcasting here and, and starting it. But Illinois, 91, 83 over Wisconsin. Uh, Marcus Damask, again, like he's a legit player. Um, him and Terrence Shannon Jr., they combined for 54 points. But Damask had, a, had what, uh, 31 points, hit four threes. And he's from Wisconsin. And uh, obviously a transfer this year to Illinois after being at SIU previously. Illinois was on fire, and it is five and one in its past six games. Wisconsin is two and seven in its last nine, and a bittersweet day for Wisconsin because there was an extremely powerful moment when they brought back Howard Moore, obviously former assistant who was part of a tragedy in which he lost his child and his wife a few years ago. He survived. He is wheelchair bound. They came in and brought him in for the first time, and. Uh, Man, oh man, that was the scene of the weekend as far as I'm concerned. And um, Wisconsin was not able to uh, to pair it with the win, which is unfortunate. But uh, happy to see that Howard Moore was at least uh, up for for an overdue moment there. And and obviously that was that was very heavy GP. I was happy to see Howard back in the Cole Center. I, I, that's where he belongs. Yeah. It also broke my heart to see him. Yes. I like. I'm just not good with stuff like that. Like I, I know that's a sweet moment. I, it, it hurts me. Yeah. It, I, like, it's just the, uh, the another example. Like life's not fair. Yeah. I mean, my God. And every day of a drunk and, driving incident. Just so if people aren't aware. Yeah, he was he was on the wrong end of a drunk driving accident. Meaning, like he was just driving with his family. Like yeah. I, like I was driving with my family earlier. All right. And he gets hit by a drunk driver. He loses his wife. He loses his child. I mean, it it makes me upset just thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And I like, I'm maybe the one who needs to understand this as much as anybody, like every day, something horrific doesn't happen to you is like a good day. You know, that is a pretty good day. We all get our frustrations, but every day, something horrific doesn't happen to you is a good day. And uh, like I said, I was happy to see Howard there, but that, 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 that broke my heart to see him like that. Yeah. No, uh, no doubt about it. Um, no, that was, it was, it was, uh, yeah, it was a tough scene, but, you know, for him to, you know, sign off and doing, they, they dedicated, um, a, a space there at Wisconsin to him and his family, which was, uh, which was very nice. Uh, Wisconsin still obviously in the tournament from a hoop standpoint, man, oh man. Um, that's just, it's just, it hasn't been, uh, getting it together as of late. And I think it's going to be, I think it's getting in, uh, it's not a lock though. I can't say it's a lock. It, it's getting tough. It's, I mean, they've just. Yeah. So they were 16 and four and now they're 18 and 11. So do yeah. the math on that. It's bad. And they had, 
I know sometimes because it took me a while to get them out of the top 25 and one because I'm just looking at bodies of work. And once you've and I know this is a, an analogy people use all the time, but they had made so many big deposits that they had a lot to take out and they still got money in the bank. If you're following me here, but they're getting close, close to an overdraft fee. <laughs> you know, they, they 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 need to you know, they got Rutgers at home that. I mean, buddy, if that ain't to get right for you, well, you have to win. That's the thing. Like, yes. if you drop the if you drop the game at Rutgers, because then uh, you gotta go to Purdue. That's that's what I was just about to say. Like, those are their two final games. Like, they they almost certainly should beat Rutgers. Like, it is a five alarm fire for their tournament case if they can't beat Rutgers because you're almost definitely not winning at Purdue. And then we got to have a real conversation going to the Big Ten tournament about you needing to win a game to get in. So, just keep that in mind. Illinois, by the way, became the first team ever to win four straight games at the Kohl Center by by virtue of getting this win. Uh, where are you with, we know where you are with Purdue and, and great stuff out of them again. Braden Smith and Fletcher Lore, I thought really important developments there. Just again, continuing to reinforce and they had they had good games. MSU, I just, I peeked around at a few different projections. I, get, I, I think Izzo's going to get there. And Gonzaga fans, I've seen a few in the chat. We're getting to you. Don't worry. We're getting to you. We got a little bubble, good bubble wins, bubble losses. We're getting there. Um, but Michigan State could have been in this uh, very well for the bubble loss situation. I just, I have them in, but man, that's 12 losses, four games under 500 in Q1 and Q2. They don't have a bad loss, but it's getting late here. And they, they're they going, I think that MSU still needs to peel off two more wins to ensure this. Where are you with Sparty? I wouldn't lose at home to Northwestern. Exactly. I mean, they were a nine seed um, as of this morning. All right. So there's some wiggle room there. That seems that's, I just can't get on board. I mean, I, I should always say they were a nine seed, according to Jerry Palm. Yeah, that's true. I know. I know. And listen, right. Palm does Palm does a fine job and we're allowed to disagree on. So I just I can't be convinced that that team with that resume with that many losses is a nine. And I and I can't. Even, it's hard for me to even, you know, reconcile them being on the 10 line right now gp and i should say just for uh, clarity's sake he jerry has wisconsin as a six still now that seems high to me <laughs> but can we get zagoria to start paying attention to the big 10 <laughs> can we shift his priorities please you know what maybe zagoria has got a point <laughs> I don't know, man. Michigan State, uh, and credit to them for playing. They they put up a good fight. But no, I, I still, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna start banging the table on this every year. Your loss volume has to count. It has I to agree. matter, man. The number of times you lose a game has to mean something. And with Michigan State, I think, and judging off what the committee's done in the past, I think it does. I think they're getting in. Don't get me wrong. Right. But I just I I think they're. The ice is thinner than you might realize. Okay. If Wisconsin is re re like six, again, equates to a top 24 team. I haven't had Wisconsin in the top 25 and one for at least, I think, two losses. Mm -hmm. So clearly, respectfully, this is a place where Jerry and I would disagree. Yeah. But if he actually thinks there are six right now as of this morning and and he's right, then they've got, they've got wiggle room to play around with. Michigan State, less so. Um, a nine as of this morning, I wouldn't lose the Northwestern at home. Cause that probably drops you another one. And then you're at Indiana to close the regular season. You know, like, listen, we can get our Indiana jokes off, but the Hoosiers have one, two straight. Yes. And they won on the road on Sunday. Right. And, and like assembly hall final regular season game, like that place is going to be on fire. Mm -hmm. Like a good team can go an NCAA tournament team can go to Indiana and lose the regular season finale. No problem. All right. So you lose to Northwestern, then lose at Indiana. You got a five-game losing streak heading into the Big Ten tournament. Now we're now we're now we're playing with stuff we shouldn't be playing with. That's just keep an eye. Obviously, we'll we'll be tracking Michigan State. And we're and good news is, you know, two weeks out to select on Sunday, you're gonna get teams that are really securing their spots and becoming locks and borderline locks. And Michigan State, just win one of the next two and you and you're gonna be good. But just don't flirt with too much fire. Uh two SEC results I want to get to before we get into some bubble stuff. South Carolina, Florida was an early tip, but it was a really good game. Uh, credit to South Carolina, 82-76. That was a there were five ranked on ranked matchups, and that was one of them. Uh, Gamecocks are 24 and five and overcame uh 56-46 deficit in the second half to win this one. Michi Johnson had 25 points, 21 came in the second half. He came alive, and then obviously peep show star Colin Murray Boyles, 11 of his 15 came in the second half, and he was really good from the line. Um, good stuff out of South Carolina to get a win. You deserve uh, your flowers here. You, you, you know, don't want you to get overlooked. Gamecocks comfortably in the field, and uh, you'll, you know, four, five, six line, whatever it is, that's a great job out of Lamont Parish. And then Kentucky, Arkansas, 
<sighs> Kentucky gets the win, and and good on them. And uh, I appreciate uh, not jinxing another team coming off a, another feature here. Uh, the the takeaways here are are one. Arkansas has been bad, and Kentucky on its home floor allows the Hogs to go in in a losing effort and get 102 points. I don't know, just not the greatest thing. But on the other end, Kentucky has had six 100-point games this season. It's the most ever, uh, ties the most ever under John Calipari. And this game in particular was the high, uh, 111 to uh, 102 was the highest scoring SEC game involving Kentucky since 1996 when they played LSU. Um, seven players got into double figures and they made, or they took 42 foul shots. Um, the final five and change GP, all freshmen on the floor. Mm -hmm. Um, which was, which was interesting to see. Uh, oh, wow. You mean in it's uh, March and they decided to start playing their best players. Yeah. How about no, but how about big Z being in that mix? Like we didn't think that was going to, after the first game when we were ready to, uh, put him in the top five of the NBA draft, jokingly, obviously, you know, the week after that, we never would have thought that Kentucky would be in the situation where it would ever be playing those five for more than 30 seconds in garbage time. Right. So I don't think that Cal is going to rely on this, but couldn't help but notice that down the stretch, um, and he had explained to Wright, Jay Wright on the on the post game interview why um, he didn't go back to, with Trey and, and Antonio Reeves. But it's certainly notable. Kentucky fans will will perk up in their seats and, and can't help but notice when uh, you go five and a half minutes. Arkansas is not good. I get it, but uh, but couldn't help but notice what he did there. Yeah, um, I'm just <laughs> scrolling through the comments here. I see a fellow named Laren. He says, hey, "Gary, he addresses me by name, so oh. he's braver than Zagoria." I see. <laughs> Maybe it is Zagoria. <laughs> Maybe it's Zagoria. I, I respect Laren addressing me by my by my by my first name. What do we got? He says, uh, he says, Gary, talk about how Kentucky is having some success with freshmen. You said in the preseason that we can't win with freshmen. Outscored Arkansas by 12 in the final 445 45 with five freshmen on the court. Okay. Let's now here's before you go into this, uh -huh. what's what's what I do appreciate about our audience is when we talk about your team, you remember this? I have no memory of you saying that in the preseason. But oh, you want to know why? Let me tell you why you don't have a memory. Because I don't say stuff like that. Because it's just not what I do. You know, Laren, you know who you are? I think that's a squirrel. I think that's a squirrel, right? You know what I say? I say things like, in this era of college basketball, I don't know if the right formula is going heavy on freshmen. All right? Which I still believe, even as, even, even as this, of this moment. All right? Because congratulations on using your five freshmen to storm back against Arkansas. Do I have to remind you that you needed to storm back against Arkansas at home? They lost more than they've won this year. I don't know why you'd start bragging about a come from behind victory over Arkansas at home. Arkansas stinks. Like you should be bragging if you won by 30 with your five freshmen, not had to storm back the win. So I don't even know. Oh, by the way, you have the most talented roster in the country by far. You're a projected five seed right now. Relax. Relax. I actually said about Kentucky in the preseason, the presence of Trey Mitchell and Antonio Reeves gave them the type of roster balance that I could, I could see working. All right? They have real roster balance there with those two guys. I'm, I'm, I'm glad the most talented people were on the court for the most part at the end of the game. I am just as encouraged by Kentucky's ceiling as literally everybody else. I said on national television less than a week ago, I don't even care what seed they are. I don't care what happens between the on selection Sunday. You have to consider them a national championship contender based on nothing more than the talent alone. But storming back to beat Arkansas inside Rupp Arena, I, I just – that's if I were a Kentucky fan – I'd hope people didn't realize that we had to storm back to beat Arkansas inside Rupp Arena and gave up a million points again. I'd hope they just talked about Tennessee, Alabama or something. Well, there you have it. Uh, on a personal note, thank you to everyone who reached out on the Reed Shepard story. It was uh, a lot of fun to do, and he's a really impressive, really impressive fella, and his family's incredible. His mom is just awesome. And if you have not seen 
Uh, there's going to be two versions of, of the video one. We did a shorter version for Inside College Basketball on Saturday. And then I believe the plan is before the week is done to get an even longer version out for social. And we need to talk. And so we'll try and uh, get that out there as well. But it is it is impressive. And, and part of the piece was how great his mom was. She is. I mean, when she was Stacy Reed. And so, yes, Reed is named after his mother. She told me that she was always going to name if she had a son, uh, her, her first boy, Reed. Um, she was an awesome all SEC player in the nineties. And while people in Kentucky have known it, I think it's in fact, Kentucky fans have reached the point where it's like, Oh really? Uh, Stacy Reed played basketball because it's become a thing. Nationally, people don't aren't aware of that. And I was, uh, privileged and, and happy to be able to write that story and bring more attention to it. And he has so much, he has had pressure on him for four years, like before, and we'll move on here, but I want to at least, uh, do a little tag on the feature, which ran on Friday. It, it became a thing where like, Oh, in Kentucky, it was like, Oh, the, the shepherds boys like he might he might be good enough to uh to play college ball and then that went from like well is he ever going to be good enough to play kentucky and if he is would he ever play there and so do you, do you go ahead i'll let you finish guys, he's lived with this for about four years and then he gets a, he gets an offer and it like he his his high school career becomes a thing that is tracked like extremely heavily in that state his dad jeff 1998 mop at the final four and all that stuff and you just would if you watch him play, like if you're listening to the pod and you didn't you don't really know much about the Reed Shepherd story, you watch him play, you would never know that you can make the case, and I wrote it in the story that there really might not be a player with a bigger combination of attention and pressure on him in the sport because of his name is Reed Shepherd and what his parents did growing up there. He didn't go and play at a, a bigger school, he stayed local, and he's like the best player to come out of Kentucky that's from the state of Kentucky since Rondo, probably. And he's the first player to be from Kentucky and continue and like be great and play his entire high school career in like Rondo left. Rex Chapman was probably the last guy to be as good as what Reed Shepard is showing. So uh, really, really um, impressive family and uh, it was, it was a pleasure and privilege to be able to both write the story and, and tell some of it in video. What were you going to say, GP? I was just going to say, if you're actually looking for something uh, misguided that I said about Kentucky in the preseason, one thing I do remember saying, and it was based on nothing more than recruiting rankings. I was making a point about recruiting rankings, not about Reed Shepard, but I do remember some version of me saying, I just don't know why if you're ranked there, you think it's a good idea to go to Kentucky. I understand the family legacy stuff. I get it. Yeah. But but people who are ranked there in their high school class do not play at Kentucky, which was, by the way, just true. True. But he is, and I know you know this, He is his case is entirely different. He, yes. I, I, you know, his, uh, his mom took me into his bedroom. He's got autographed, like, Anthony Davis, the entire 2010-2011 team, bench players you would never even know. Um in fact, his mom told me his last official visit was to Ohio State. She didn't even go. Like, she didn't know truly where he was going to go, but she's like, I know he's not going to Ohio State. So you guys, you and dad can go off there. So they, there was a sense that he was going to do this, and that's basically what he said. Uh, but you're right, and now look at the way it's 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 turned so out. I, I turned in a mock draft a few weeks ago, and I might be high, I acknowledge, but in a weak draft, I had him going second. Oh, my gosh. I'm not saying it can't happen, but it's wild. That it is gone from. If he's in the draft, he will be in the top ten. I I would think that I, I, he is certainly pacing himself to be to be that. And Nada, by the way, tells me that the uh, the video short is up on our CBS Sports College Basketball YouTube channel. So if you're watching this on YouTube live or after the fact, feel free to tap on through. Uh, don't want to keep you too late. Let's keep it moving on here. Let's go bubble bubble winners, bubble losers. I know Gonzaga fans. Here you go. We're going to talk about you right now. Um, G Gonzaga lock. I, 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 yes. I, I mean, come on. They yes. feel it. This was, as, they're in. it's over. Anybody suggesting they're not in is well, just create. It's well, just, Paul, it's just Paul said on HQ at like 12, 10 Eastern. He didn't go lock. <laughs> I did a hit with him and Akeem Dermott. She was like, I can't, I can't go there yet. I will bet my life. So, are you that Gonzaga is in Paul, the right? <laughs> I will bet my life against no, Jerry Palm's life. No, don't bet your life. I'll put my life on the line against Zag's Frisbee collection that Gonzaga is going to be in the 2024 NCAA tournament. I will yeah. bet my life against his dog. Okay. Well, I, I tell you this. It was damn impressive. Um, Gonzaga went 70 to 57. Wasn't that close. Now 24 and six. Graham EK with his seventh straight game of 20 plus points. And Ryan Nembhard. Uh, where were these dudes for the first two months of the season? And I'm going to answer that uh, rhetorical question because Mark Few 
talked with media afterward and he said, listen, like part of the deal here with some of these teams and, and I'm going to paraphrase on him. And I'm sure he was thinking if he didn't say this exactly is, you know, you get a little spoiled when you're a one, two, three seed, you know, year after year after year. And then you actually have a year where this is what it's like most of the time where you got to try and get to know each other and gel and build. And this is actually relatively normal behavior. And now they've, they've been able to do it. And uh, they're going to the tournament uh, in terms of what seed they'll get. That becomes another fascinating thing because they're not going to, they're probably not going to have home whites in their first round game. And so that gets really, in- you tell me Gonzaga is like in the eight, nine game. Whew, ba- I'm here for all of that. I don't care. Can you imagine if it's freaking Gonzaga in the eight, nine and, and produce region, man? Are you kidding me right now? If it's that uh, online haters of both those programs will be coming out of the woodwork. Are you kidding me? Um, big time stuff for them. And Oh, by the way, St. Mary's not winning at home means that for only the second time in the past uh, 12 plus years or so, we don't have a single team that went undefeated in the league play in the regular season. We almost get at least one. We did not get that this year. The most recent time that happened was 17, 18. There's some more bubble stuff, but let's, let's focus it on the Zags and what they were able to do. And, and let's, let's just say it, man, that was an ass kicking and really impressive what they did late in Mirage on Saturday night. I also saw Mark's post game comments. He said, he said, it's amateur hour, people talking on TV. (laughs) I think him and Zags are conspiring against me. They're in cahoots. What if Zags and and Fuey are in cahoots? They're in cahoots right now. What if they got a little group? I will playfully push back on this with Few. Uh, He said, like, I'm not paying attention to that. No chance in hell. No chance. You're aware of where you are in the projections. I I don't buy that from Few, but it's coach speak. I, I, um, I, I under, listen. When you have flipped it the way he's flipped it and talk, you talk, I, I, I'm fine with it. I don't even mind it. But like the idea, I can't speak for what everybody said on television. I don't see it all. All right. But the only thing I've ever said on television about Gonzaga is that they don't have a resume right now. When I, when they didn't have a resume, I would say they don't have a resume right now. They're at real risk of missing the tournament. They don't have a lot of opportunities left. And most of them are on the road. Every time I or you or anybody else said that, it was true. Every time. Like I wrote in the top 25 and one on Sunday morning. They had a resume. It just wasn't, it wasn't a not, an, not one for the NCAA oh, tournament. Not, I'm just saying. Like, every they time. had an NIT resume for a while. Yeah. Um, when they lost to Santa Clara on January 11th, they were hovering around 50th in the net, and they had zero quadrant one wins. And at that point, I think they only had four quadrant one opportunities ahead of them. Mm -hmm. And three of them were on the road. It wasn't looking good. And that's all anybody said is that it wasn't looking good. Well, now they've strung together these wins. Yeah. um, Eight in a row. They've added three quadrant one wins in this eight game winning streak. All of them on the road at Kentucky at San Francisco, which counts as semi away, according to Ken Palm. It is semi away. I don't think you should be able to just move your home game and, and have it rendered semi away. Well, uh, <laughs> well, I don't. Well, but it's not their building. I don't. I don't. They probably had reasons for it. I guess to probably get more money as a program. You know, the other thing I don't like. I don't know how you. We have never talked about this. I don't mean to get off track. Okay. I don't like that Big East tournament games are home games for St. John. That doesn't seem fair. It's a weird one. Um, like that, it's not their. It's not home games. You know I know. Box it and save it because we're we might need to. Okay, go go go. Yeah. This on a, on a future, but I but I hear you. It's actually worthy of discussion. There. I also say this on Gonzaga, dude. Of all the years they had, so it used to be a regularity, or at least a semi regularity, for about a decade that Gonzaga would get a notable non-con game in February. It was a very good accent on the college basketball schedule, but because of conference bloat, that has gone away for about the past seven or eight years. But it just so happens that Calipari and Few, they're good friends. Few convinces Calipari to do this six-year series, and year six is the final time they're actually going to play at Rupp. <laughs> I, mark me down for Calipari. He's not even coaching Kentucky by the time we get there. Whatever. But it lands in GP. Of all the years where you need a road Q1 for Gonzaga at this time, like this was – It was manna from heaven, man. Like they needed that because if they didn't have it now, they might win the auto bid. And so it's moot after the fact. I get it. But in the moment right here, right now, if they didn't have that Kentucky game and let's say they just filled it with a halfway decent game in December and it's fine, but it's like Q2 or Q1, they're not in the field. They're definitely not a lock status. So it is 
it's kind of wild how of all the seasons after not having a high profile February non-con game, not only did they get it this season, not only did Cal and, and, and few like come to an agreement to not play it early in the season, but it happens to be on the road and they happen to win it right before Kentucky kind of turns itself around. I just, I found that to be pretty interesting in how it's uh things are, everything's coming up Gonzaga at the moment. Um, Just to sort of, I don't want to just say Gonzaga is a lock without explaining to you why. I see this all the time on television. It drives me crazy. I see people, they're just like, oh, I think they're a lock. Oh, I think they need to do work. Oh, I need. I think they need to win their conference tournament. And unless you actually sit down and put pen to paper and like look at it, look at the bottom of the bracket, and it's you don't really know what you're talking about. So here's where the Zags are right now. They're six and six in the first two quadrants with three quadrant one wins. They do have one loss outside of quad, um, and they only have one loss outside of quadrant one. That's tremendous. Only one loss outside of quadrant one, six and six in the first two quadrants, 17th in the net. You ain't getting left out in the top 20 of the net, all right? So I believe no matter what happens in the WCC tournament, the committee's just simply not going to be able to find 36 at-large resumes better, period. They're probably going to play San Francisco again in the semifinals. Even if they were to lose that on a neutral, it's a quad two loss. They'd be one game below 500 in the first two quadrants. Okay, yeah. Don't lose to like Portland if Portland gets there or whatever. But okay. Yeah, it'll be okay. But I know what you're that's, saying. That's where it gets complicated. That's where, like, if you want to talk, we can talk. If no. Portland or Loyola Marymount upset San Francisco and gets to the semifinals, then if you lost that one, it's like either a quad three or a quad four, depending on the team. Perfect. Maybe then you got, maybe then you got to talk. I still think they're in no matter what. I don't want to. So too. I do. Think I think so. they're in no matter what. But just, just, just know that if they end up playing Portland or Loyola Marymount, they have already played those two teams a total of four times this year. They won those games by 34, 32, 17, and 21. They're not, they're not losing on a neutral court to Portland or Loyola Marymount, which means the worst thing they can do in the WCC tournament, reasonably speaking, is a quad two loss, and that's not going to hurt them. I mean, it'll hurt them, but it's not going to knock them out. Gonzaga's going to the NCAA tournament. Book it. Yeah, uh, good. Uh, good for programs in that part of the country here. Washington oh, State. One, one, one thing. State. One thing, real quick. You you mentioned Graham E.K. Let me. Tri- do you know the trivia time? I don't. I don't think I know it. Maybe trivia he scored time. at least twenty in seven straight games. First I, zag ooh. to score at least twenty in seven straight games. Dude, if this isn't Timmy, like I don't know anything. Don't tell me Timmy never did this. Timmy never did it. Get the hell out of here. That is <laughs> unreal. True, Timmy never did. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, that, that makes no sense, by the way. It doesn't make that makes zero sense. That's a wild nugget. Um, it's not Timmy. Uh, who would it be? Do, 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 do. How about give me Rui? Never happened. Uh, pre Rui. Pre Rui. Wow. Um, pre Rui, but but post step, post Blake step. Post Blake step pre Rui. I know it ain't Josh Heitfeld. Um, I wish it was Josh Heitfeld. Uh, I'm gonna Did say Josh Olin- Heitfeld get in trouble for I'll mushrooms. Say, I know, yeah. I'll say Kelly Olinick. Maybe I maybe I messed up on my years here. Can I just say it? He had a mustache. Uh, who was a famous other than Timmy? I know, give it to me. Are you kidding? You don't know a Gonzaga player with a mustache? Well, I mean, Timmy is the one that I think of more than anyone. Um, who am I else? Am I? Uh, there's an obvious. Oh, Mo- Morrison. Gotcha. <laughs> God, Adam Morrison. You remember Adam Morrison, right? Dude, it's one of those where it's like, dude, Morrison was the last one to do this. That's, that's incredible. That's according to what I saw that uh, Graham E.K. is the first Zag to score 20, at least 20 in seven straight games since Adam Morrison in the 2005 6 season. Wow. How about that? Dude, that's incredible. Chat You've even got Morrison crying getting on you in the chat. I know. Morrison crying and literally calling me. I know. I got you, folks. I, listen, I, I hear you. I'm still reeling from the fact that Drew Timmy never went seven games in a row with 20 or more points. Um, I was going to give a shout to Washington State. Not sure. a bubble team. You're a lock. Okay, you're a lock. You know, talk about locks and how I'm litigious with it. Dude, Wazoo, lock, great win. Let me give you a quick rundown on bubble results. Take it from there, and then we can tell the people what to watch and get out of here. I was on the bubble, 87-80. At Northwestern, good win, 18 and 12. Um, won four of its past five. It's just gotten onto the bubble. It's not on the better side. It's on the bubble now. South Florida, in my opinion, is now on the bubble. Not on the better side, but USF won at Charlotte, swept the 49ers. Nation's best 14 game win streak now because St. Mary's went down. Um, not knocking on the door, but I'm just telling you, I'm open to this conversation. If they can get to at least the American semis without a loss, just you know, put it in it. We'll come back. Bad bubble losses. 
I'll give you four. Oregon gets rolled by Arizona. Get them out of here. Um, New Mexico, just six big Mountain West. It's we got some doubt here. Credit to Boise State. Here's a here's a little bit of a stunner for you. Boise State has won five in a row. It's the only Mountain West team to pull that off so far in league this season. Leon Rice's team sitting pretty there. Omar Stanley, 24 points, 13 rebounds. Good for them. New Mexico just took back-to-back L's for the first time this season. It's in. It just can't mess around. Two more uh, bubble losses. Wake Forest. Man, that's 87-76. You lose at Notre Dame, and then you lose at Virginia Tech. Uh, You still got time, but it is running out, and... Uh, I think I don't have it up. I'm pretty sure that uh, Wake only has one quad one win. So does Auburn, by the way. But Auburn's obviously in a much better spot there. That's a tough one. And then Virginia, 73-48 to number 10 Duke. It was down 40-18 to at the half. It was the largest halftime deficit for a Virginia team under Tony Bennett since 2013. Um, It was Duke's largest win ever, 25-point margin against Tony Bennett, uh, period, and Filipowski at 21.7 rebounds. Uh, the timeline was going wild because Kyle Filipowski was looking a lot different on Saturday than he was the previous Saturday. You folks can have fun with all that. Virginia has been held under 50 points four times in his past five games, and this is the only time that Virginia has multiple losses of 25 points in the same season under Tony Bennett. They previously got rolled by 34 against Virginia Tech. Those are your bubble losers. Virginia's in the field. But, man, it is uh, it is getting shaky in a hurry, uh, just like it is with a lot of other teams we talked about on the show. What's your takeaways from any of that stuff, GP? Um, with Wake, they got Georgia Tech at home on Tuesday, Clemson at home on Saturday. Got to win them both, right? Yeah, they don't have a choice. Yeah. Like, you have to win those games just to, to stay in the conversation. Like, you lose one, you might be looking at uh, three wins in the ACC tournament, maybe. Depends. Like, again, no one team's results are happening in a vacuum for the most part, but Got to win those games. Internet's out in Charlottesville. I said one kind of critical thing about Virginia a few weeks ago, and boy, I was getting lit up. I ain't heard nothing from nobody all day, all all weekend. I just don't. I, I understand. I, I get it. I get, let me just stop and start there. I get it. But like, it seems insane to me that a Hall of Fame coach can have a basketball team that can't get to fifty. <laughs> I mean, that just that seems crazy to me. Well, he's not technically a Hall of Fame coach. But, he's but probably, he will be. Probably. Well, if they never get to 50 again, I don't know about that. Tony Bennett is going to be a Naismith Memorial Hall of Fame basketball coach. Can we get them to score 50 at least one more time? In Boston College, you know, I'll do respect. I know it's a road game. Can't, can't be. They uh, scored 40 in the 40s and three straight losses in four of their past five games. Well, they, they've been asked lately, as Joshua Clark in the chat is accurately pointing out. That's, that's right. I would just. If, if I had a basketball team that couldn't score more than 40-something points, I would just do something v- dramatically. I would just say we're running from now on. I can't – I cannot have these jerks on a podcast talking about we can't score 50 anymore. So, like, let's let's get let's get moving. <laughs> I just wouldn't keep scoring in the 40s. I would I would do something. Virginia, let me bring up the res- uh, resume. Let me bring up the schedule here real quick. It's a problem here. Uh, UVA. Uh, I think they're going to get in, by the way, uh, even with all this. Oh, trouble. yeah, they're still like they're still in the field. Nine. Oh, they only got one more home against Georgia. They take the week off to home against Georgia Tech. Yeah, I want them to get in the get field in. and then up somebody upset somebody in the round of 64, 38, 36. There's, it would that would anger so many people. But I'm telling you, I and not caring whether Virginia loses or not just to it would bring me so much joy to watch just like these drive by people that check in on the sport in March. And like I can't stand this program to me. That would be hilarious. It would be honestly, Jerry. I almost called you Jerry. Gary, if if Virginia won, let's say it's let's put it on the eleven line. So it's eleven going against. Let me give you a sixty. Let's say it's Virginia against a Mountain West school. Okay, Virginia, Utah State, and it wins. Not Danny Sprinkle. You can't do this to Danny Sprinkle. That's a team that's in the that's in the six seed conversation. I'm not going to let you do this to Danny Sprinkle. I'm putting it on Danny Sprinkle. I'm sorry. And it is Virginia gets out of there 44 to 40. That is, and I'm not rooting for it for Utah State or Danny Sprinkle, but the idea that Virginia will barely get in and <laughs> just win a, win a game where the combined score is like 86 points would be just, <laughs> I couldn't help but laugh as we watch the world burn. That's all. Ah, You ready to look ahead? Yeah. What do we got here? All right. Let's look ahead to the next two nights. Actually a big one on Monday night. Um, Duke at NC State. We are headed toward 
possibly mm -hmm. Duke Carolina this weekend, ACC title on the line. But do you realize if Duke doesn't win Monday night, that's probably over. Yeah, well, if so, if Duke doesn't win, Carolina is guaranteed a share. Is that true, or is it? Or just if Duke doesn't win, games? Carolina is guaranteed a share, and then Carolina has a very winnable game midweek. Let me make sure I've got it right. Yeah, they're Notre Dame at home on Tuesday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm assuming Duke. If Duke, I'm not assuming Duke loses. I'm saying if Duke loses, I'm assuming Carolina wins, and that creates a two-game gap with one game left. Yep. There you go. Carolina's your outright champs. Can't be done. There you go. Okay. But that's Duke at NC State. Yes, and that, that makes it, you know, like Duke's better. Duke should win. Duke will be favored, but like, you know, it's a it's a road game. This actually matters in that region, by the way. Um, the ACC travel partners for basketball next season came out, and it's, you know, SMU, Cal, and Stanford are joining. Duke and NC State will not be playing a home-and-home -home for the first time, uh, maybe ever. I don't have it in front of me, but uh, that actually means a ton in that area, and I know that there are NC State fans who are none too pleased with the idea that now that Duke and NC State will only play once instead of a home-and-home. -home. Triangle schools, et cetera, et cetera. So locally, that actually means a ton that Duke's playing on the road there because they might not play at NC State for another two or three years. And then um, we also, on Monday night, we get Texas at Baylor. Texas has won two straight. Horns up. Only fair. Dead leg. Yep. Horns up. Right, Horns up. Yep. Let me see him. Horns up. Yep. Horns up. So that's uh, Monday night. That's the way I'll be spending Monday night in a hotel room watching those two basketball games. Uh, Tuesday night on CBS Sports Network, I'll be in studio. We got a triple header. Ohio at Buffalo. Dayton at St. Louis. Mm -hmm. And then San Diego State at UNLV. Then we'll, have in, then we'll have inside college basketball uh, a little after 1 a.m. Eastern. So stay up late for that. Elsewhere, big Purdue one. at Illinois. Big one. Yep. We remember when I called my shot about UConn going to Creighton and I was like, watch out. <laughs> you ready? Yeah. Watch you you watch think it's out. going down? Okay. Watch out. This is where I could have to change the top 25 and one on Wednesday morning. Uh, you might have to. I know you're not looking forward to that. Um, it would break my heart. But Illinois, uh, Illinois is going to be favored in that, is it not? Ken Palm had it. The last time I looked at it, I think it had Purdue okay. minus one, and it is Ooh. still Purdue. Projected score at Ken Palm, 84-83, Boilermakers. I will say that when the line comes out, then they'll, uh, Illinois by one. That's my guess. But, some, you know, we'll see. That's, right. That's, that's, um, yeah. Providence at Georgetown, you mentioned that. That's Ed Cooley against his old school. Yep. And then Alabama at Florida. Florida is the last team in the top 25 and one right now. Mm-hmm. Um, I dropped them a few spots for losing to South Carolina over the weekend, but their resume is getting a little out of whack. They're they're taking they're, they they're losing too much. They, they need are. To, they're not a lock yet. They're close. They need to stop the door, but they're not a lock. They need to stop losing. They need to stop doing that. Yeah. Okay. Well, there uh, there we go. Well, um, I think that's a show. And well, I, 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 yes, yeah, I, yeah. I do want to because God knows if this were the other way around, okay, I'd have mentioned it in the open. Oh, oh, oh. we you got you gonna do it? I feel like I have to, or else I'm a hypocrite. Well, go ahead. I think I've been mounted. You just don't get it, do you? You don't. You don't. You don't. I think I've been mounted. Tell the people what happened. I didn't keep track of it, but somebody tweeted me, and I'm going to trust them. They said you went five and zero, oh, and I went zero oh and five. Is that true? That's a shame. Oh, it's I true. I think I've been. I think I've been mounted. You have been. Mounted and surmounted. Holy God. But leave it to Nada, who thought he was getting out of this show without getting dragged. It's the one damn week this year <laughs> where he didn't make a freaking uh, Photoshop of our picks. So there's no, I have nothing to put up on the screen right now. We do have evidence on the show. But I didn't realize until after this was all done that we had picked different outcomes for each game. You were leading me by four going into the weekend. You are now down to me by one because, again, you got too, you flew cl too close to the sun. I did. Airful Will Icarus, too close to the sun for your Willie, wax wings. Willie Nelson told us about this, didn't he? Didn't, nope. Willie, didn't Willie Nelson tell us about this? You tell me. <laughs> I don't know what song you're referring to. I'd like to be but I'm not. I'm not knowing the discography inside and out. Angel flying too close to the. Isn't there something like that? Here we go. Yep. Angel flying too close to the ground, not the sun. 
<laughs> yeah, you know what I meant. <laughs> no, you got no, no. You were you were Icarus. You were flying too close to the sun. Yeah, I should have. That's why when I say when you want to bring it up, you just don't get it, do you? I feel like I didn't think that. I feel like I didn't focus enough last Friday. You did it to yourself. I know I did. That's a story. Really of my life. I was I was willing to let this go and hang until next Friday. Uh, I felt obligated to bring it up. Congratulations that, in to all you. Sincerity, that is freaking incredible. I didn't know we picked it. Uh, I didn't know you picked opposite me for all five. And the, I went five and no GPO and five. So now it's a one game split. If you want the updated records, we can wait for the Friday show. I'm sure GP will be all too eager to update you. Yeah, I can't wait. I can't wait. Shouts to Devin Downey. Shouts to Chester. South Carolina. Shouts to Terry Miffentigle. Legend. Shouts to Huck. Shouts to Larnell. Shouts to Willie Nelson. Yeah. Love Willie Nelson. If you're not subscribed, please go subscribe anywhere you subscribe to podcasts, including Apple and Spotify. More of us than there are of them. That needs to be reflected in the comments. So make sure you're doing that. And we're going to talk.